That is the idea of dynamic development, that we don't create these rigid static distinctions so that everybody appropriates uh, these languages, these language practices as their own. And I think I also gave you the example of this, and this is um, the idea of uh, the old and the basically new, right? That bilingualism is not dual, is not linear, is not subtractive or additive. There is no L1 and no L2. There are no first languages and second languages. What, the, what there is is a continuum, an interpenetration, an interdependence between all language practices that uh, was given to me by this sixth grader once in Amistad who told me that even though Spanish runs through my heart, English rules my veins. So this, is, this idea of this dynamic development and not the two things are separate. So what is it then that we have to do in schools in order to act on emergence, act on dynamic bilingualism, and act on dynamic development? We have to consider this dynamic bilingualism as a resource for all, and notice that all is capitalized, and I say all because I think many of us understand that this could be a resource for the students who are in ESL classrooms, or the students who are in bilingual classrooms, or the students who are categorized as English language learners. But what some of us fail to understand is that this should be a resource for all children, right? In one of the schools, I don't see the principal here, right? In one of the schools in Brooklyn, their students are uh, speakers of Tajik, Uzbek, Urdu, Spanish, you name it, right? And uh, it would be a wonderful resource to, to get these students, all of the students, to understand what these languages are, where they're from, what their histories are. Central Asia, Soviet Union, what happened to the Soviet Union, uh, the script, uh, different from uh, the Roman script, the directionality, not uh, left to right, but uh, different. So all of these things are things that really could be a resource for all the students to understand their world. But beyond that, you cannot have a good bilingual program or a good ESL program and then forget about bilingualism, do all of this, and then forget about bilingualism once the students uh, are, are no longer else, what, right? <laughs> not even when they're no, not former else, not even if they have never been else, right? Uh, a child, half of the students in New York City, one half, over 50%, go back to homes in which English is not spoken, or is spoken in addition to another language, right? So if you know that as a reality, you know that you cannot ignore the child's bilingualism even if they are perfect English speakers. My children did not need uh, Spanish as a scaffold, but they sure needed Spanish to feel good about themselves. And what I always say is that unless you feel good about who you are, unless you feel proud of who you are, of your language, of your culture, of your parents, you're not going to be able to be successful. If you're ashamed of your parents, if you're ashamed of what your parents speak, of who they are, you cannot then uh, be, su be academically successful, even if you have passed an ISIS lot and if you're a four in the ELA. Right? <laughs> so I think we, we want to also look long range. I know you have a job to do, which is uh, right now, but I think you want to look long range what is it that you want for these kids, for this community? Some of you are, I mean, I've been, I am so honored to be in your presence because your job is so difficult and I have been in places that are, uh, that really remind me of how difficult the work is and how many of you are really, really have oasis for these children in communities that are devastated, <coughs> poor, where um, there is very little going on. So and this dynamic bilingualism as a resource for all is, is important. Um, so a, a way of also think of, of thinking of how this dynamic bilingualism could be a resource is again using translanguaging in uh, interrelationship. 
making sure that translanguaging is a scaffold for your uh, emergent bilinguals <coughs> especially, uh, but really remembering that it's also a discourse practice so that even if they're no longer emergent bilinguals, they would really benefit from it. Uh, making sure that's a door, the doorknob. You can't open a door without a doorknob. And what you really have to do is you have to provide a doorknob to open the door, right? So those are the, affor the affordances. You have to figure out what are the doorknobs? You know, what are they going to look like? How are you going to open that door for the children? So that's the doorknob. And of course, understanding that these performances, bilingual performances, are not suspect, are not criminal, are not of illegal uh, aliens. Um, they're not of undocumented people. They are really uh, practices of bilingual Americans, and I, I, that's important. And, um, and then our second principle, right? I mean, we always say, well, <coughs> our vision is of emergence, of dynamic, de uh, dynamic bilingualism, and of dynamic development. In order to do that, you have to, one, make sure that you use bilingualism as a resource, and two, create this multilingual ecology for all the kids in your school, so that it just is not just those kids in those little programs that you have for them. Because as you well know, some of you meet uh, AMOs because the uh, children pass the ISIS lab, but you don't meet AYPs because they're not threes and fours, right? And so um, you have to think of how to create this multilingual ecology because even after they have been reclassified and no longer else, uh, you have to provide this uh, space for them. So one way to think of it is to think of a flexible bilingual continuum. That is, don't think of categories. Don't think of else, former else, non-else, right? But think of this very flexible bilingual continuum. Hello. Uh, it, that's fine. Um, this flexible bilingual continuum that uh, children have to adapt to and that you have to provide, provide the affordances, the doorknob, to open that door, and then make it all inclusive, right? Don't just do it for those kids who need it. Use it because it's, it's an enrichment for all. It's a, it will enrich our world. Um, I want to end just by, I have a few more slides, but I want to end by um, um, sort of summarizing some of the things that I've seen, which... Uh, and by the way, I have not visited all your schools. I think I've visited 14 of the 27. Uh, so um, some of you I don't know anything about, and you might have lots of good things to tell me, so tell me, because it, it would be good to know. Uh, but uh, last time, we um, came up with this quote that I think is in, um, in Olga's school, right, Olga? Where is Olga? Yeah, right, it's in Olga's school, this quote. Uh, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. It's Martin Luther King's uh, quote. And I thought it was appropriate. Susan Bauer used it in her school the other day with her teachers. I heard her, I heard her quote him. Um, and I think that is it's an important statement. It's an important statement. We are, we are changing the ways in which we educate these students together. Uh, we can't do it all at once. You're going to be asked to put together an improvement plan. You can't do it all at once. You have to take the first step, right? Don't worry about the whole staircase. Just like the kids don't know how to emerge from that tunnel that I, got, I, I, I showed you in the beginning. Just take the first step. Just know that, that it is, it, this is a journey that we're starting together. Um, so some steps that people have already taken, and I just want to, uh, uh, I just want to point it out. And again, I'm sorry that I, I am not uh, citing all your schools because um, um, I don't know it all. But um, one of the things that I've seen is that principals have just taken it on. You know, they they have been speaking up for emergent bilinguals. They have been saying. This is something I want to do. I've seen it in many schools, and I've even seen it across districts, which has been very, very nice. Um, I've seen a principal actually sit her staff around the table uh, and say, all right, we're going to do this process that I learned to do at, uh, at the Graduate Center. We're going to do this together. So 
she has been actually doing with her uh, school team a collaborative descriptive inquiry in the way that we have been doing it in the afternoon. Uh, there has been also, I've seen a lot of common planning time that has been created together. So that's one thing that I've seen. Um, this is Middle School 390. Uh, and uh, one of the RAs um, sent me this the other day. She said, I went into the school and um, the coordinator, or the principal, I'm not sure who, took me aside and said, Heather, look what we did, right? And, and they had created this bulletin board just with welcome in different languages. Uh, it's part of uh, starting this multilingual ecology in the linguistic landscape of the school so that we see these languages reflected and that we recognize not only the big languages, not only Spanish, but also the little languages. We've been visiting a lot of schools with a lot of West African students, Mandingo speakers, Soninke speakers, Kui, uh, you name it, we have it. Uh, many of them quadrilingual, they're way ahead of us, right? Recognize this uh, linguistic diversity and this richness, don't hide it, right? Learn about it, it takes effort, it takes us taking a first step, it takes us um, it takes us being brave enough to embrace what we don't know and to embrace the fact that these communities and these children many, many times have understandings that go beyond what we understand and we want to bring those in. I know Arilda was also working on a, um, on a, a mural for her school. I told her to take a picture so she might have something for us today. Um, I was in a school the other day where the principal had just a wonderful session with the parents along with the parent coordinator and myself in which she actually asked the parents to share what linguistic and cultural strength they had to share with the school and their funds of knowledge. It was an amazing session, right? Wouldn't I say? Yes, absolutely. It was an amazing session. I learned so much from those parents. I mean, of course, you know, they said the things that you would expect. They said, well, we can have a class, we can do a, a class on beauty for the girls. Beauty. Beauty. Okay. And the other one said, well, we can do, I can, I can teach them how to embroider. And the other one said, oh, I can teach them how to decorate a cake. And the other one said, you know, it was a, a, an award winner, a choral poetry award winner in Puerto Rico. I know how to do that. I know how to declamar. And I know all these uh, poetry that I can teach the children. Well, that was, that was something else. Then there were people who said, well, why don't we do like a language day in which all these, all the, uh, they're trying to also incorporate the African parents. All the parents bring in something. And then one of them said, well, why don't we cook? And then the other one said, no, but it can't just be cooking. It has to be that if we teach them how to make a sancocho, we ask the kids, uh, well, what are the ingredients that are needed? How much should they weigh? How, how many potatoes would we need if we did this recipe for 10? And how many would we need if we did it for 20? Uh, writing the recipe, reading sancocho recipes. This was a, a, a teacher. She was a teacher. It was amazing what these parents came up with, right? Uh, and another one said, it can't just be a day. It has to be that maybe we work with the teachers and we can have each grade be a different country and then change. Um, I mean, they could have written the curriculum, right? Right, Mr. Wolofsky? I mean, it was amazing. They could have written the curriculum. No one had asked them before. And I really thank this uh, principal for having the courage to ask. It was absolutely amazing. Um, so this is something else that I've seen also in, in schools. Um, this is a school where the ESL teacher allows the students to annotate the text, right? So you see, for example, that in this uh, poem that they're doing, I see the earth stirring. She, the, the girl has written girar. I hear a faint sound. Uh, I don't know what it says, but anyway, it's a little seed, semilla, so she has annotated the text, which again is something 
that we all do when we read in a language that is not quite one that we dominate, right? And this principle.